It's on. Oh, it's on. Okay. okay. You're, you're alive. I'm not alive. <laughs> Relatively speaking, yes. Okay. <laughs> this book is uh, Cheeky Swimsuits of 1957, and it's, I just finished it last month. I went in to see the old fellow as he was finishing his morning coffee. Good morning, Father. I'm back from Yale. Ah, sacked again where you comb. Not this time, Pop. I graduated. <laughs> Summa cum laude? Hardly. But I understand there were several athletic chaps whose grades were lower than mine. Not at the bottom, then. Well, that's something. I expect they'll be drafting you soon. I already had my physical, Father. I have a bum elbow from all that tennis and squash. The Army doesn't want me. So what's next for you, lad? I was thinking of trying my luck in Hollywood. Acting is it then, the final disgrace for the family? <laughs> no, independent film production. This is 1957, Father. The studios are passe. There are splendid opportunities out there now for independent producers. I wish you the best of luck, son. Uh, of course, I'll need a bit of capital to get started. The old fellow smiled and sipped his coffee. He has only one sort of smile, always unnerving. You know, your Uncle Jonathan died. That was a while back, as I recall. Your absence as his, at his funeral was commented upon. It was the weekend of the big game with Harvard. I could hardly be expected to miss that. Jonathan left me his little company. That a appalling firm that makes those hideous swimsuits? I'm finding it a bit of a distraction. I'm thinking of putting you in charge of it. A generous gesture, Pop, but I have no interest in ladies' swimwear. I expect ladies' underwear is more to your liking. Even you were young once, I reminded, it, I reminded him. I think I could manage with 50,000. The old fellow smiled again, never a promising sign. Were you to prove successful in managing this business, I might consider investing in your film enterprises. Impossible, Dad. I've already promised Betty a big part in my first picture. She won't marry me otherwise. Then I'm saving that young woman from two ill-considered fates. Sorry, Pop, I must firmly decline your proposal. I understand, son. I suppose you could survive merely on your blue eyes and wavy brown hair. Aren't you forgetting my allowance? A fellow offered a challenging position at a going concern is in no need of an allowance. Blackmailed by my own father. What a foul day this was turning out to be. And me with a raging hangover. My head throbbed as I considered my options. How long would I be indentured to the dowdy swimmers? Only for a year, son. That's half the time the army would demand. I'll have my secretary arrange for your bus ticket. Bus ticket? Lots of my college friends are getting cars as graduation gifts. For example, one of those new Thunderbirds would suit me fine. You've already crashed three cars, Colm. You're a menace on the highways. But only when drinking I considered retorting, but then thought better of it. <laughs> Sober, I'm acknowledged to be a superb driver. And only two cars had been wrecked. The third was just moderately dented. Instead, I asked, Bus ticket to where exactly? Ukiah, California. <laughs> oh, is that a suburb of Los Angeles? <laughs> Possibly. Western geography is not really my forte. I'm sure you'll love it there. That last part he, ad he added with his most ominous smile. For the record, I should note that my hair, inherited from my late mother, is a light sandy blonde, not brown. 3,000 miles on a Greyhound bus. Could purgatory, purgatory be any worse of an ordeal? One realizes along the journey that large swaths of this country really should be ceded back to the Indians, or broken off and redistributed to the hapless Canadians and Mexicans. Nebraska probably is the worst, hot, dusty, and absolutely devoid of anything appealing to the eye. How people exist there is a complete mystery. Plus, it goes on forever. I'm told Nevada is dreadful too, but thankfully I, I slept through most of that desolate state. The bus pulled into San Francisco, which appeared intriguing, but then I had to board another bus heading north. We crossed the fog-shrouded Golden Gate Bridge, laden with tourists, then continued on for hours. 
Borrowing a map from my seatmate, I was shocked to discover that we were headed in the opposite direction from Los Angeles. <laughs> Fast retreating Hollywood was hundreds of miles away. Eventually, even interminable bus journeys have to end. Are you sure this is Ukiah? I asked the portly bus driver. It sure is, pal, the one and only. Is this the distant outs outskirts of the city? I asked, peering doubtfully out the window. Nope, you're right in the middle of town. State Street is one block over. But we're in the middle of nowhere. It's the seat of Mendocino County, kid. That's as exciting as it gets around here. They have their own, their own courthouse and everything. Now move along, because you're blocking the aisle. Since no one showed up looking for me, I ho hoisted my grip and trudged over to what was making do as their main street. I checked into a palace hotel, which might more probably have been named the Sagebrush Hotel, as the grim lobby featured bas-relief cowboys molded into the plaster. Palatial it was not. I was assigned a room on the third floor, evidently the highest point in the entire town. I had a grisly dinner in the hotel's dining room that fed coin after coin into the lobby payphone in a futile attempt to reach Betty. Her Provincetown roommate informed me gruffly that she was out with a saxophonist. My girl dating a horn player and me exiled to the frontier an entire continent away. Of course, I blamed my father. The old fellow seemed determined to sabotage my life. I decided I'll stick it out for a week and then chuck it all and head back to civilization. A week in wilderness hell should be enough to convince even my father that I've made an effort. Impressions of Ukiah gleaned from a stroll in the fading light. Tall hills to the immediate w west and distant hills visible in the east. Lots of rustic natives driving battered pre-war cars. Big trucks stacked with immense log, logs chugging noisily through town. Numerous bars and honky-tonks suggesting that beer gu guzzling was a prominent feature of daily life. Daily life. Matrons window shopping in hats at least a decade out of fashion. Swarthy loiterers in straw sombreros speaking a foreign tongue I gauge to be Spanish. Unbarbered louts roaring by on large throbbing motorcycles. Stark marquee of the lone cinema advertising Peyton Place, plus a, plus a newsreel and two cartoons. Not many patrons in line on this warm Wednesday night. Although this is alleged to be the West, no actual horses or cowboys were seen, but suspicious barnyard smells occasionally wafted by. I bought an ice cream cone for five cents, then returned to my hotel in its lonely and lumpy bed. Unfortunately, the waitress at the diner where I ate breakfast had heard of Milady Modest, Inc., and gave me directions to its location, five blocks south of my hotel. Yeah, we're sort of the bathing suit capital of the Redwood Empire, she commented, refilling my co coffee cup. My aunts worked there in bra cups forever. <laughs> Not an appealing image. I put down my fork. Do you have one of their suits, I asked to be polite. Not me, honey. I'm not quite old and decrepit enough for their styles. <laughs> but I expect I'll get there eventually. What's your interest in them? I think I'm supposed to work there. That brought her up short. Doing what, pray tell? I'm not sure. Being the boss, I think. Okay, honey, if you say so. You some kind of hotshot fashion whiz kid? Hardly. Well, I doubt even you could make their suits any uglier, so good luck. <laughs> Thanks, I'll need it. I was in no hurry to commence my day, but eventually I paid my bill, 65 cents with 15 cent tip, and wandered south on State Street. Milady Modest occupied a nondescript stucco building on a side street beside an alley. A sign on the battered metal door read, Not Hiring Today. Nevertheless, I opened the door and entered. A middle-aged secretary looked up with a start, then pushed a button on an intercom. Mr. Slidmank, she hissed, I think he's here. A moment later, a thin old guy, bald and stooped, bustled out from an office. Mr. Moran, he inquired. That's me, I admitted. He gave me a weak squeeze with a bony hand. His lint-covered suit hung on him like a costume prop in a low-budget play. I'm Wendell Slidmank. We were expecting you yesterday. Was your bus delayed? 
Afraid not, nobody met me, so I spent the night at the Palace Hotel. The palace, he exclaimed, goodness, that must have been expensive. It was 725 plus tax. That much. You must have got a deluxe suite with bath. That wasn't the plan. Since you'll be staying at your uncle's, late uncle's house, the plan was for you to go there. Yeah, well, nobody told me that. How curious, he, he replied. Well, you're here now and welcome. Let me show you around and introduce you to everyone. So I met the designer, the pattern drafter, the cutter, and the bookkeeper, all elderly female occupants of the cramped and cluttered front offices. The stout secretary, Miss Page, doubled as the fitting model, whatever that is. She was the only one who could have been younger than 50. A swinging door led to the production room, smelling of steamy fabrics and mixed perfumes, where a dozen or so sewing machines whirled away, then abruptly halted. Lady, said Mr. Slidbank, this is young Colm, Mr. Colm Moran, Mr. Jonathan's nephew from back east. I heard someone wh whisper, well, at least he's not a beatnik. <laughs> we'll see, someone else whispered back. Morning, ladies, I stammered. How's the sewing going? Not bad, said a white-haired woman, holding up what appeared to be some sort of half-finished glove. We're getting the hang of it. Low tittering from the seamstresses. Mildred has been with us for 26 years, said Mr. Slipbank. She's one of our veteran employees. Why is everyone sewing gloves, I asked. Are gals swimming in gloves these days? More tittering. We work far ahead of the season, the old guy explained. The great majority of our orders for the 1957 lines have been shipped. In our slack months, we make a variety of utility gloves. Mr. Slivmank and Joe in the warehouse appeared to be the only male employees. Joe's cluttered domain in the rear of the building was stacked high with dusty cardboard boxes and bolts of cloth. A low table held a variety of folded boxes and shipping supplies. Lo, said Joe, shaking my hand. He was at least Mr. Slidmake's age and by far the shortest person on the staff. 